All right, we are live. Welcome to another episode of the Athletic Transformation Project podcast. I'm your host. I'm joined today by Matthew Scar from Scar Performance from Instagram Social Media Sensation. Um, Matt's an ATG Level 2 coach, former Division One soccer player, uh, kind of current soccer strength coach, doing a lot of very cool things. And I'm very excited to kind of have him on the podcast and chop things up. So, Matty, welcome to the show, man. Thanks for having me on, brother. I'm excited. Absolutely. Me too, dude. So since we both know each other through like ATG and that sort of thing, like how long ago did you first get involved with that? Um, what was your kind of intro to that world? Yeah, I so I started as a client online, just doing the online coaching when I was I started the summer before my last year of soccer. So that would have been 2000 and summer of 2021 or 2020 or something. And I did the online coaching for six to nine months or something through my last season. And I had, I mean, I had a host of injury problems and it was helping, but it, I mean, it, to have eight or nine years of injury problems, it's going to take more than six months, um, even with the online coaching. So I was seeing improvements and afterwards I got, I was in pretty good shape once the season had ended from it. So I had already kind of had the idea I wanted to start helping soccer players. I'd been kind of a nerd with all the strength and conditioning and the skills work and everything as I went through. Um, so the jump from online coaching to being a coach kind of made sense. And I remember listening to Keegan and he was referencing all the people that I knew and he knew more about all of them than I knew about them. So I was like, all right, man, I, if I if I want to learn more about this and be better at this, I gotta just take the leap and jump and join. So that was that was how I got into it. And that would have been probably almost either a year and a half or two and a half years ago now. It's kind of a blur. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it goes by quick, especially with everything that's been been going on in the world. Like, okay, so that's interesting then, because you found it earlier, much earlier in your career, like than I did. So you found it while you were still like playing and stuff like that. And obviously had a lot of kind of work to do to kind of unpack or rebuild so maybe didn't get the full experience or benefit of it while you were still an athlete but like for me it was that ship it had long sailed before i got into that so i am very curious of like kind of what it might have been like having found that um prior or like during my career maybe what that what that might have looked like because it's it's funny looking back now like the the stat that i always have that i joke about is like my freshman year at florida tech like as a college athlete legit like you've made it what i ran a 5 2 40 yard dash um which is not the quickest and like my i ran a 4 6 a couple of years ago i'm i'm just got a sneaking suspicion i could i could break that now and so like to to have that level of like transformation and something like that is very interesting that's honestly what what sold me on it the most personally um cuz i didn't have a ton of injury problems i had a big ankle one that was got me into this route. But once I got back from that, I actually got into it for more of a performance route. Um, so what has this past like year, two years, I guess like three to four years now been like for you in terms of where you're at before to kind of where you're at now? Yeah, I I mean, I, I got it in from the injury perspective. So I, I'd seen Ben before online, whatever, um, and all the ads doing his crazy things. And I had just pulled my hamstring in, uh, it would have been 2020 actually because we were in our 2021 we were in our COVID spring season I just pulled my hand she was like all right I'll give this guy a shot and I mean it helped so what I what I noticed the most was I I had like a lot of problems to be fair ankle uh knee hip groin back I was I was kind of in shambles that I went through and what I noticed in my last season was I just felt less bad as the season went on after trainings not, like, not good just less i got i like that. Yeah, yeah exactly yeah. <laughs> and it it was like this is kind of crazy because i've never i've never just like i was used to like being scared to walk up the stairs after training because i was like this is not going to be fun but it like it was getting better and better which was cool um and it, it i mean i think part of the problem was i had so many things I was dealing with in terms of the injuries and not having a deep enough understanding and still kind of like ego lifting myself through some of the lifts. So not getting a full benefit out of it that I could have, but 
I mean, I, I was, I had done enough training before that I was, I was pretty athletic, even as, even in there, like I was, I was jumping 30, 30 something inches off of a standing vertical and running somewhere in the four, six to five, 40 yard dash, depending on who was timing it, I guess. But it was, for me, it was like just all about feeling less bad as I was doing it. And I mean, it, it took me a long time and I'm still, there's still, a, I still have an ankle thing that I have just like the one, the last 1% is way harder than the other 99% when that's you've sad. had something that's an eight year long injury. So Frito distribution, like that first 20% gets you 80, but that last 20, you got to work your ass off for. Yeah. And then, the, then that the 80, 20 keeps going. It's like the 80% for the last 20 and then that. So we're, I'm right at the end of it. I was talking to Cal Dietz has actually been helping me with it some, okay. um, like nicest perfect. guy ever I'm talking about yeah i've actually interacted with him some too and he was again same same deal like the nicest guy in the world like i was literally just some kid in like high school or in a uh, college i was just emailing him about stuff like so I, well, tell me about that yeah i mean so i i was just like i want to talk to cal Deeds. like let me just get a consultation so i that's something that i've started didn't doing option, by the way <laughs> i didn't either i had to email him and he like sent me the link for it but I was like, Hey, do you do consultations? Like I want my kind of viewpoint on it was like, I've gone through as about as much of your stuff as I can. Like I went through the spring angle course. I looked at tri -Fasic. I've watched all your YouTube videos, done some other stuff. It's like, I, there's some things that just aren't super clear to me. It's I rather than trying to figure out, I'd rather just ask you like whatever yeah, it, it doesn't cost that much. Yeah, I'd rather just ask you once is always worth getting some hands on. Yeah. And then it's like, if I still have this little bit that I can't haven't been able to clear my ankle, like there's something that I don't understand quite well enough yet. So let me just ask you. And I mean, to be fair, like it, did, it did help. So it's some, some things that I would have overlooked, like that's not that important. Like one of the things was, it was kind of crazy. We were maybe five minutes in, I was kind of like talking to him about stuff. He's like, I think you just need your talus adjusted. It's like, what? He was like, yeah, I think your talus is just out of place. I said, what are you talking about? And uh, talking, he wasn't even like looking at you, like just talking. Yeah, I hadn't, I hadn't shown him anything yet. He was like, I think you need to get your talus put back in place. And I kept asking him questions. He's like, you just like, before we even do anything else, like you just need to get this talus back into place. I was like, all right. And I went to the chiropractor and like, sure enough, I, this is kind of wild. They put my talus back into place, and I swear I gained three inches of ankle mobility. Wow. Three so, might be three might be a overestimation, yeah. but two somewhere around two. And it's like I can do a flat ground HG split squat, no problem. I can Olympic squat the flat back, but it was it was just shifted a little bit. So it was a little bit a little bit blocking. And I I mean, good athletes have good compensation patterns. I think I developed a pretty good compensation pattern after eight years. Um, and I mean, yeah, it's, it, it's I, I, I was, I really like having different perspectives on things because we spend so much time in the ATG community that it's good to get somebody who has a totally different viewpoint on things like that. Yeah, hundred percent. I mean, that's one of my biggest core philosophies is like, do trying, like trying to sample from, from all of these different people, like, you can see successful people in different endeavors or in different fields or like with different backgrounds all over the place. Like someone like Cal has gotten phenomenal results with his athletes and someone like Ben has gotten phenomenal results with his athletes doing things that are extremely different. So trying to like take pieces of each of those, like I'm a big proponent of looking like of results over methods of like, if somebody's doing cool stuff, like figure out why <laughs> trying to take away like that, that, that piece of why that's happening. Um, so much there that I'm interested in, like, okay, so with the tailless thing specifically, like, is that something like, had you, could you feel an, like an impingement, like that blocking, that sticking point with any movements you talked about, you had a full split squat, like all these different things. Like, is that, you know, that, like that sticking, that impingement on the front of the ankle, is that something you ever felt? It was. How did you, I, that's what I, that's what I'm getting at. Like, how I don't know. I really have no idea how we knew that. Um, but it was, it was funny. Cause I, he's just like in a hotel room at like the day before the national championship for, college hockey and I was just 
whatever. But uh, I mean, I could, I could tell if I put myself in the right position. So if I try to do like a Patrick step up off four or six inches, lift the toes up, squeeze the arch, make sure there was no pronation there. And then I tried to do it. Then it was, it was pretty clear that there was something like something was hitting that wasn't supposed to be hitting. It just didn't glide as well as it should have. Um, and if I, it's all about, for, in me in that situation, it was all about, I got really good at pronating and then my knee would shift outwards to like simulate having ankle mobility that wasn't there. Um, so that putting that kind of back into place and I've had to do it a couple of times because it, it's, it's pretty used to not being in the right spot. Um, it just kind of opens that up and lets it glide a lot better. So I, I went to the chiropractor. I was like, I need you to teach me how to do this. Like, <laughs> I need you to teach me how to have somebody else do this. So like, I still, I trained my parents. Yeah. I was like, I know this means I'm not going to come back that often, but I need you to teach me this. <laughs> it's less money for you, but I need to know this. So, wow. Like, yeah, I'm, you're not allowed, like, I'm not allowed to have my dad do it, but my, I train my parents as well. So like when my dad comes, I'm like, Hey, I need you to just really That's fast. So. Wow. All right. I might have to try that just to go see if that's something that's, that's very, very cool. Okay. So I definitely want to get into some of the work with like Cal. He's somebody that I've, I've followed a lot, especially in like my early days of strength and conditioning and that sort of thing. Um, so I definitely want to get into that and how you integrate that with, with ATG, but just while we're kind of just coming back to your kind of story of getting into it from the first place, like you and I sounds like it came from kind of opposite ends of like, you were a decent athlete who was like broken. And I was a shitty athlete who was okay. <laughs> so like both of us trying to, but both of us getting into the, into it from, from those opposite directions. That's kind of funny. So when you talked about starting to feel less bad, I mean, cause you've had more of a background in like you were training, you were familiar with um, strength training, like all these things. That's something you'd been done for quite a while. Something that you were quite proficient in. Like what were some of the differences when you first started getting into some of the ATG stuff? Like what did you notice was different? What were some of the things that you maybe struggled with or like what were some of the areas that it exposed that like, even though you've been doing all this training, like this still sucked, your Nordics were still terrible, like whatever it is, you know what I mean? Yeah, I, one of the biggest things I actually remember, and it was, this was weird because Ben put together something I'd seen in my head before was we had kids when I was playing that could rep out full Nordics and it was always the best athletes which now we're like, duh. But like, for me, I was like, dude, I thought I was, I, I thought I was pretty strong. Like, why can't I do this full Nordic? And like, I, I kind of could cheat it out if I like really tried and I got a good night's sleep before and I had a good meal or whatever. But like other kids were hitting like three, four or five. I was like, you never, I know you've never done that before. <laughs> like, I how never, the hell are you doing that? Yeah. And then I, I wanted to do it so bad that I built a Nordic bench and I still have it downstairs. I think I have more Nordic benches than any gym in the world right now, actually. But um, I built it and I sucked. Like I was really bad on an actual Nordic bench. I was like, this is probably part of the reason that I keep pulling my hamstring. And then, and now I'm, I'm pretty good at them now because I sort of obsessed over them. But seeing going through the program and just seeing it expose like all of these weaknesses I had was kind of eye-opening in terms of like I was solely training to get more athletic the whole time injury reduction was sort of like an, if I get stronger I'll get injured less but that was the big thing for me it was like you have to really hit these little things that you don't think of like yeah you can go jump and do your plyometrics and squat a lot up to a box and do all of your hamstring curls or whatever but like if you're missing these links it's just not going to work together that's kind of what i found too of like it definitely like it cre it increased like horsepower and output but i had those like the atg stuff came in and kind of like filled in a lot of the cracks that were missing and so i think like a lot of times that people will go down that route and they'll get again like that increase in output to, so to speak, um, but they'll either like experience more probably what I did where I was just like limited by those links that were just never developed or maybe some of like your route of like those links will actually come back and bite you and like that's where you'll run into some of like the, the injury side of things and so then just kind of cleaning like 
filling in those those gaps allows the whole system to to level up and kind of perform better. It sounds like what we're honestly kind of both both coming at. Yeah, exactly. I mean, it's it's like people react to things in different ways. So what I I mean, I was big. I was I was big on Caldies at that point. I was big on West Side powerlifting. I was big on kind of the plyometric guys that you see, like Paul Fabris and all that. Who are, I mean, they're all really good coaches for sure. Like not to take anything away from them, but it just didn't work for me. It wasn't it wasn't enough for me. And not to say that if I go back and do some of the programs now that I wouldn't get a ton of benefit out of them, but like it it very much wasn't what I needed at that point. Like I got strong. Like I, I remember put like I squatted 275 for a couple, like one of the first times I started doing actual like ATG squats. And I was like, this is like, like that was, this is pretty easy. But like my seat of good morning was like barely 45 degrees. I couldn't do a Nordic. There were other areas. I was, I hadn't been introduced to the structural balance idea at that point, but man was i out of balance in terms of that so i had the ability to like move fast and jump high as long as it didn't hurt too bad at the time but it it, it just took so much out of me to do it the recovery was super super poor and every i mean it took me forever to warm up gotcha gotcha so it's definitely something you couldn't just like kind of tap into and access by any means oh not even i I I distinctly remember to get my ankles to a point where I feel like I could even play took me the whole warm up and we did long warm ups in college it took me the whole warm up and about halfway through the technical drills is up so I and I every time we had a rest I would sit down I was doing ankle circles I was moving like I just had to move my ankles for 30 45 minutes to get them to a point where it's like all right they can they can move beyond here like to start yeah. it was that was bad that i'm glad i'm past that yeah i can imagine i can imagine like and as someone like my one injury was an ankle so i can i can relate to they can be very not fun like they're very weird compared to compared to other spots like so what is some of this like integration then looked like like now you talked about like kind of bridging some of these different worlds right like sampling from some of these different people like cal Dietz in particular like what has some of that integration looked like with with some of the HEG stuff, both with your training and like guys that you're working with now? Like, yeah, kind of how does that how does that blend together? Yeah, it's so one of the one of the distinctions that I think needs to be made kind of when I talk about somebody like Cal, like when you see all of the really nuanced things he puts online with different bands and the oscillatory stuff and different like really explosive things that you're like that's not full range of motion it's like all right well these dudes are already squatting a truck and this is about turning like absolutely peaking your throwers your sprinters your power sport athletes this is the whole their entire sport is towing the line between injury and the highest performance possible so you that I mean, we talked about earlier with like an injury, that last half a percent is so difficult that it doesn't necessarily look like the rest of your training. So when people see it's like, oh, but Cal just does these throws and the these bounds and all of that, it's like, yeah, you're a soccer player. Like I would rather you be two percent slower and just not have to worry, get worried about getting injured. That being said. Like something I really like is the adding in the spring ankle ice metrics. I know you do, you've done the ice metrics too as well, but get into the point. It's, he said it and other people have said it and I'd like to repeat it, but your ankle's the only thing that hits, your foot's the only thing that hits the ground. If your foot is weak, it's just, I don't care how strong your hips are. I don't care how strong your knees are. If your feet suck, you're going to suck. Like, it's just as simple as that because you can't transfer this force that you're producing into the ground. So being able to strengthen the foot efficiently, like I, I love calf raises, I love tib raises, but I posted about this earlier today. It's like, we want to put your foot in those really high force situations. So I really like the spring ankle. I really like an, even an overcoming isometric, just pulling against the chain like that can be a really beneficial thing. And 
depending on where you are in the process, maybe you just need to build up to holding for 60 seconds in the spring ankle positions, or maybe we want to have you work really hard for 10 seconds against an immovable object. So something like that, I really like is a crossover. Um, and then when it comes to athletes who have the base and when soccer players, that's a remarkably small group of people, which people like to think that they have the base, but rarely do they. Like I didn't have the base. I thought I was pretty good. I'm sure you, when you were playing, didn't have the base you thought you did. Then we can start adding in cool things. Like then it's more, then we can add in more of the higher intensity plyometrics. You can add in some contrast training. You can add in these different things that allow you to peak and allow you to use the strength that you built more efficiently. But I see a lot of people that put, and this was me exactly in the past, putting building that strength and athleticism above building a base because it's more fun. It's like, yeah, cool. I get to go jump for 30 minutes in the gym and then I can do a couple squats and whatever and go home. Yeah. I mean, if your whole career is predicated on like, I have to get these guys faster now, I have to get these guys to jump higher now, that's what you're going to do. But it's, it's not always the best thing in the long term. Like that's something I remember Keith Barr saying. It's like the slow building of strength is what helps prevent injuries. Not that plyometrics doesn't help, but it's there's a balance there. But when you're a coach, that it's like people looking at you like, are these guys getting faster? Are they jumping higher? And you kind of are separate from the injury injuries that happen. It's like, all right, cool. Let's do contrast training. Let's get them to jump. Let's get them to power clean day one. Let's do all these things. It's like, yeah, but are you like the Ravens now? That did everybody tell you it's a ACL? Not. Sorry, Ray from coaching staff, but it's, uh, I said, I said a lot there, but it's the real art of coaching is finding the balance there of getting people fast now, but also setting them up for the future because the, the most important thing, and here's something that I don't think is talked about that often. If you're in pain, you will never, ever, ever play as well as when you're not in pain. I remember days where I, I thought I was like the greatest player in the world because I showed up and I wasn't hurting at all. This is very rare, but I showed up and I wasn't, I didn't have anything that was hurting. And I was, I was electric. And then the next day I was like, Oh my God, I am hurting. And then I played like garbage. So, I mean, it's like, I don't care how fast I am. If I just, if I'm playing like that second day, every day, it, I, it's just bad. So I think the it's it's such a contrast for me having seen both sides of it with myself in the past, but just being able to play without pain is an unbelievable thing for your performance. No, hundred percent. I think there's so much to to get into there. I like I actually like the distinction that you made in the very beginning of like the the setting and the outcomes that both of these guys are going for, like Cal versus Ben like Cal being in a collegiate weight room setting, like where you have a scheduled sports season, like a lot of the, especially the track and field guys, like it's a very single, like singular events and stuff like that, that you have to prepare for be at your absolute maximum. And so a lot more of that traditional periodization approach where we have these different peaking events and things like that versus someone like Ben who routinely talks about like all the stuff that he's putting out online. I know he's done different stuff with like teams and individual athletes in the past, but like all of the stuff that he really, really promotes is just designed for his old 12 year old self to be able to go and like you said, like hoop without, without knee pain, like just to be able to play without pain. Um, I do think that is such an underrated um, skill just because it's like you said, like that pain side of things. I talk about it in my training, um, like with all the people that I have coming back from injuries all the time, but it is a, it's like a rate limiter on the brain. Like it will just dial things down regardless of how much output you have. And so one of the fastest ways to get somebody to perform at a higher level is just to remove the brakes rather than trying to add in like juice up the juice up the horsepower. And so that makes that makes a lot of sense. Um, it's interesting too, like the spring ankle stuff is the stuff that I've probably, like you said, I've probably taken the most from him. I do really, really like that. Um, how do you use that specifically? Like, so you talked, so we, do you go that same progression of like body weight 60 seconds or so? Like what's the middle ground? And then you said so you go to more of like the overcoming isometrics. Yeah, I think generally I 
I don't have like a specific weight. It's like, all right, you can hold 60 pounds now for 30 seconds. It's time for you to do overcoming. No, it's like, it's 60 seconds easy. Let's find a weight where 30 seconds with that weight is hard. And when it becomes like, if you have to start using straps on it, it's probably time for you to go for the overcoming. Mm. It, it's the, the jump in force that your foot is dealing with for from like a 45 pound dumbbell to a 60 pound dumbbell, I don't think is significant in comparison to the amount of force that you would have in an overcoming isometric. So once you get to 60, I tend not to spend too much time in that. They call it level two. Yeah, I, think it's kind of I almost skipped level two. Uh, it's so like, you say that. yeah, it's, I mean, it's valuable. It certainly yeah, is, else, but yeah. it's like, let's, let's get you into the highest force variable possible. And then on top of that, maybe you add in, you can add in some plyometric to build the elasticity with it. Um, Cause I, I do believe the farther away from the hips, you get the more sort of elasticity and plyometrics you need, but like if you can't do a calf raise with any significant amount of weight, you probably need to do that first. Yeah, yeah, hundred percent. Like, yeah, I've really been like in the. I've actually been getting into more of like Alex Natera's like um, overcoming isometric stuff. Like he'll use that like almost ex exclusively as a as a program. And so we have like a couple of Smith machines in our gym that work amaz amazingly well for that. You can set the different heights and, and do different stuff. So I've been using that a ton. Um, just to kind of touch back on like the, some of the differences with with Ben and Cal it is so interesting when you talk about the the fun stuff versus like the foundation and that sort of thing of like squeeze. I always use the analogy of like the toothpaste in a toothpaste tube. Like you can grab the middle and squeeze and you're going to get more out than if you like kind of roll it up at the end. But if your goal is to get as much toothpaste out of the tube as you can, like it's starting from the back and going that very slow, slow until you can squeeze all of that out. And honestly, like it, it messes with my head, like Ben himself, like as a uh, example of his like teachings and stuff like that is someone that messes with my head so much because he has almost exclusively, like maybe literally exclusively, like just built the foundation and ignored the rest completely, like doesn't do plyos. Like I know he, like he plays basketball once a week. He does his dunk session. Like, okay. But like, he doesn't do any of this, like short peaking methods. Like he doesn't do and any of this stuff, any of the plyometric training, anything fast, anything ballistic, just does his slow, like structural balance, like building the base, building the foundation and is still getting better. Like is still still jumping higher is still just like it's not like he hasn't hit i keep waiting for him to like hit like a ceiling of like diminishing returns of like i was like all right now i gotta start doing some of these other methods and it just like at least for him like it hasn't happened yet i know I, like it's just a single like n of one like all of that stuff but it always like messes with my head a little bit when i'm like oh okay i need to start doing more of this stuff I'm, I'm, I'm not as good as ben though like and he can do so that's something that i i come back to a lot it's so so interesting of that idea of just like how high can you build the top of the pyramid just by um, building the base and then like expressing that in sport, I think is the way that, that he talks about going about it. But it's, it's so interesting because it flies in the face of any and all like concepts on periodization and peaking and like developing athletes and that sort of stuff. But it's like, again, for me coming back to the idea of like result, results over methods. And so like, dude, still jumping high. He's like, I don't know, 10 years in, 15 years in, he's still like, not just maintaining, like still jumping higher, still running faster. It's like, shit, like, okay. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, Yeah, there's so many, there's so many things that you can just like dig in on Ben. Like if you really sit down and think about him as an athlete, you're like, this is the weirdest thing I've ever seen in my whole life. And I, I mean, I think he's talked about in the past, like he'll dose in a little bit of plyometrics every once in a while on and off through the last 10 years or whatever but it's like i think he did the opposite of your to use your toothpaste analogy he built this massive tube of toothpaste and then like he's like all right i could use a little bit of plyometric stimulus here and he just went like in a ton shot out and it's like he's like all right that's good enough for me and it keeps that tu tube of toothpaste keeps getting bigger and then every time he squeezes it like more comes out like he didn't he's not trying to squeeze every ounce of plyometric out of it so it's I mean, yeah, you said that when you were on our podcast a while back and I've thought about it ever since. I was like, yeah, this looks cool. I should try that. But it's like, I'm not anywhere near where Ben is right now. I should, 
I probably should just keep doing this. And like, it's really interesting because he doesn't squat that much. He doesn't split squat that much. I mean, his posterior chain work is good, but it's like, there's other guys that will blow him out of the water on all of those lifts, but very rarely is anybody springier and bouncier and more bulletproof, which is kind of an odd term to use, but it's, you can dig into all these little things. It's like, how, how do these like signify something bigger? Like, is it, is one of the keys to athleticism absolutely controlling a weight and preventing yourself from moving forward faster than you would like to like is that part of the reason why power lifters aren't as athletic as you would imagine with how much they could squat again this is what a power lifting squat but like is it is it moving too fast part of the reason that you don't get athletic returns on your lifts it could be ben might have mastered that without like subliminally been like all right just if I get really, really confident with these weights and the intent is always there at 100%, is that more important than going up in the weight faster? Or is it, I don't know, man. It's it's yeah. unbelievably I mean, interesting case study. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it is one of those, like, there's no, like, answer to it or anything like that. Like, it is just some, like a thought experiment. Honestly, that idea of actually that you, that you kind of finish with there of like the, the intention behind it um, and the, like, makes a lot of sense to me. Keegan's talked about it. Like when he just talks about tension and muscles, when he talks about short range versus long range and how we can increase tension just with position and that sort of thing. And like, so is Ben to your points, like, is he increasing intermuscular tension just through like the intent, the way he's doing things, even though like if externally the load on the bar is maybe not the same, but we know that like, depending on how you squat, like if you kind of shift your hips back, like the load that the muscles will experience will be different, even if like the weight on the bar stays the same. So yeah, to your point, like, is he just milking that for everything it's got, but creating more of like those actual internal changes within the body rather than being obsessed with the actual, the actual numbers on the bar. So that's, something that that's that sounds true like that sounds like probably more of what he's doing whether it's intentional or not um i hadn't quite thought about it like that so that's that's interesting i think that that makes a lot of sense and definitely is one of those like you do see within like even just within the the community of guys and stuff like that you can tell a big difference in who's getting the best results in the way they execute the movements, like hands down by far. And so like you see that with with everything, right? Like the way somebody does something, but particularly with something about these movements, whether it's just like them being so much long range or they're being a little bit lighter. So like you need to have better quality of movement to actually get something out of that. But like you can see people who kind of just go in and out of a split squat, maybe don't fight for that last little bit of range, like versus the ones who are just squeezing every little thing they can out of that. And you can definitely tell who's doing that versus who's doing the other style just to, to your point, like new in the community, you got to get the ego, like got to get the numbers to all, all of that stuff. So I can definitely see that side of things as well. Yeah. I, this is something I've talked about with, I don't know if you've ever talked with Keith Alpert. Um, he's an ATG, but he was, he was friends with Charles Poliquin for a long, long time before you and I were born. Um, and I was talking to him about that. I brought that idea up to him and he's like, yeah, I have got, like, he'll have, he's a basketball guy first and foremost, mainly, but he's like, he had college basketball players come to him and he's like, yeah, they got kind of strong. They were leaving the off season benching 185, 205. Like, I mean, the strict Poliquin, 19 inches or whatever it is, slow 401, 41XO back up, perfect, perfect technique. And he was like, yeah, they would go to school and he would see them on social media, like, just hit 365 and he's like <laughs> this looks like shit this is so so bad but it's it's like i think you get so much more out of that 185 or 205 than you would out of that 365 that looks like you're having a seizure when you're doing it or something like it it's no, I mean, to that point, like I'll see actually probably that's one of my maybe my biggest frustrations and something i'm still working on like getting out of my athletes more as a coach, like within with all my people coming back from the ACLs and stuff like that. And I think it's true, whatever you're training with, whether it's performance, you'll see people who execute on different levels, but like, especially with like how people are coming back. I'm so much like, it's gotta be like, I'm almost like 
gripping on like it's <laughs> got to be like I, I know you're tr you're going through the movement but like the intent is not there and like if it's not there you're not going to get what you want out of it so that is something that's that's very very interesting that i think i probably even just personally um could could do more of because it is after you've been doing it for a while it's very easy just to like kind of go through the motions and that sort of thing but to actually like yeah oh okay so the the language that i had around that i i lost for a second is like we're what I always tell them is like, we are chasing the adaptation from the weight, not the weight itself, or like we are doing this for what this is going to give you, like whether or not this number on here goes up means re relatively little compared to what it is that we are trying to get out of it. So stop chasing that because you're sacrificing that. And I think that one concept is probably the biggest difference maker in who gets the best results the fastest, at least from the people that I work with is the ones that have that intent to squeeze every little drop they can out of everything versus the ones that are trying to like get the number or like chase more of like that external stimulus like just get the workout done like that sort of thing yeah i mean it's it's like you're not in the weight room to squat more weight you do you want to squat more weight because you think it's going to make you run faster and then that's what's going to make a difference on the field but it's like if you if somebody told me like yeah you just squat 185 pounds for the rest of your life but you're gonna run a four three forever like i would Unreal. it would take me like a half of, like it would take me absolutely no time to accept that deal like it as much as i like squatting heavy weight i much rather run fast like it's that's i mean that's the point of it and i and mean you do that with less like load with less like stress on your system all the better too like yeah. And if I don't, yeah, if I don't like using, I don't have to shoot my nervous system every time I want to squat. It's like, it, it's perfect. I mean, granted, there's like the aspect, it's like somebody might come back and say, oh, you just want to run fast. It's like, let's do your sports specific drills. It's like, let's, let's hold, let's hold on there a second. Cause it's, I'd like to be able to run fast without having any pain is also a big part of that. Like if you offer me that deal, it's like 185 pounds for the rest of your life. You want a four, three, but your knee's always going to hurt. It's like, I'm, I'm not going to take that deal. Like it's the pain-free part of it is a huge, huge aspect of it. And more important for in my, maybe since I was never in that super unathletic position, I don't, I don't know the like. It's a great pain. Place to... Yeah. Just pain, pain-free is like my goal, my whole goal. But it's like, Maybe if I was our, running our like a box six. Yeah. Our pain is psychological and we <laughs> <feel> like we're <laughs> um so I'm curious because I actually like just to play devil's advocate. So I want to touch come back. You touched on the idea of um not like shooting your nervous system. And I think that's probably something that again, just coming back to Ben specifically, like he comes at it from a almost purely physical structural approach of like, can we build the actual pieces? And maybe that's where some of the intent comes in. I want to get into that. Um, but before, like, just to play kind of devil's advocate of what we're talking about, like, you do see people on the other side who go about it, the like, who come from the exact opposite direction of like the sprinters, like the someone who grows up like sprinting their entire life and has barely ever touched like a, like a weight or a weight room or anything like that, but has like is jacked athletic, like can run, like has has developed all of the pieces from the activity or from the output itself. And so, so that's where it was actually an interesting conversation I had with uh, these guys called like Uber Zati in uh, Melbourne um, that I did, did a recent podcast with and they have these like specific treadmills that they'll do at an incline. And so it's, it's very, they're all, if Ben is all structural based, which not to say, but like just to, for the sake of argument, they're almost, and there'll be people who are all output based, like neurological of, can we dial that up? And then by doing so, assuming you don't break them, like key big caveat, like the pieces will develop because of that. Um, and so it's just, it's so interesting. Again, I don't think it's one of those like, yes, no, right, wrong. But like, you'll, you will see people on that, uh, that opposite side of the spectrum, the sprinter who's never touched a weight, who's extremely strong, can do Nordics without ever having ever trained them. Um, or even just people in the training space who train for that that max output, that neural drive, the Alex Natera overcoming isometrics, like the plyometrics will use all of that and do very little. Like they'll look at us and be like, you guys are bodybuilding. You guys are doing whatever, whatever. That's not athletic. And they'll build, they'll build the pieces that way as like a byproduct. 
Um, and so I guess that's one of the big debates in like the fitness industry. Now you see people on both sides, maybe from like the movement camp versus like the, the structural camp. And so it is, it's interesting. Like I said, there's, there's, there's no yes, no right, wrong. Um, but you do see that other side of things. And so I think it's like, you have to at least acknowledge that, like give it its due if we're going to have that, have that conversation about the structural things. Um, cause you will see, it's easy to get sucked into that trap of like, I have success doing this one thing, or I have some form of success, like how much better, or like, this is the way like, um, and that's one thing that Cal to even bring it full circle has always been, I've admired as him, his ability to like change or pivot or like, say like, this was not like, he doesn't use the term wrong. He was like, this was like not optimal. And so it's like, how can we always be like what he was doing with his athletes 20 years ago wasn't wrong. Like he was getting results with it then. It's just, can we get even better results with it now? And so like, we will never be perfect. It will never be right. But how close to optimal can we get? And so not to like sidetrack it with that, but just those, that two, like that dichotomy idea that those two different camps is something that I find interesting and like have to respect a little bit because it is, it's hard to say one way or the other. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, I think part of, part of it, not all of it. Part of it is what you're training for. Like if you're a sprinter, all you're ever going to have to do is sprint. There's no, there's not going to like suddenly be another guy in your way on the track. Like you just have to sprint from the start to the finish line. And like when people bring up the mobility argument, it's like, I want just enough. I, I only want 111 degrees of between the between the legs when you're sprinting because 110 is where you get the stretch reflex um so yeah cool i understand that from a sprinting perspective but if you're a soccer player like there isn't just one thing you need to be ready for like somebody's gonna hit you and you're gonna end up in a full knee bend with one leg wherever you need to be strong in that position like it doesn't really matter if a i mean i, I think it matters i think it is important for a sprinter to be strong in a full knee bend but I think it's even more important for like a soccer player to be strong in a full knee bend or in these extreme ranges because things happen on a soccer field that you can't expect. So if you train your joints through a full range of motion, like it's, and you build, develop strength there, it's like, well, that's about as far as your body can go. So you're a little bit more protected in all of these positions. I still think, I still think when you talk about the stretch reflex, it's like, I don't think mobility hinders the stretch reflex a lot. Granted, you see a lot of really tight people that are really like twitchy and athletic like that, but I don't think that means you can't be in the other direction. Yeah, I mean, all like, you have to do is look at a Kador Ziani or a Bruce Lee or any martial artist to like, it's you, there's enough examples out there of people that have gone the other way that it seems, yeah, hard to believe. Yeah, and I mean, okay, you want to like, you want to be Usain Bolt, maybe you need to be a little bit tighter. It's possible, but maybe not. It's, is you think that, time? Like, I don't know. Like a lot of times I feel like sprinters like are honestly fairly supple. You know what I mean? Like, I don't know. Yeah. Like there's, there's videos of like you saying bolts, hips being fairly mobile. Like yeah. he's not like a board, like he can move, like he can get into position. Like, is he squatting full depth? Astrograph? I don't know. I mean, I've never seen him try, but it's like, it's, I don't, I don't know if I, I, I buy the tightness argument. Like Keek has made the argument that being a really tight as a power lifter is kind of like wearing a uh, squat suit. Yeah. And that's it's like, sense. yeah, it's, it, it might, but it's also like yeah. Dawson Wyndham is like, can squat deep and hit a full seat of good morning with more weight than I can squat. Like, and he's mobile as hell and squatting an unbelievable amount of weight, pulling a lot and with that. So it's, it is funny. I, every like must should have to. There's an example of somebody who's world class who does the opposite, and so that's that. I always find that I always find that interesting. Of like, you have to be flexible. Here's somebody who's tight as a board who can fly. You can't be flexible. Here's somebody who's can bend over backwards who can fly. Like, there's all there's always an example of the of the opposite. Yeah, it's kind. Of, it's like when people talk about the foot. It's like there's people. It's like if your toes don't look like hands, you're never going to be athletic. And then you see LeBron and his toes all look like they're broken. Yeah. But then you see people in the other, it's like, you got to have your toes tight together in a bunch. Like you have to have the, you got to limit the surface area. So you put more force per pound, a square inch. It's like, yeah. well, like Kuduriziani's feet look pretty good and they work pretty well. So it's, there's, there's gotta be parallel somewhere or they're 
what is even scarier is that there might not have to be parallels anywhere <laughs> yeah why does there have to like yeah it's like it's well so shit, now i don't now i'm searching for a, a truth that isn't there yeah. and then you're just into the realm of optimal which is way less fun than truth <laughs> but potentially more like potent maybe optimal is the truth like is the closest we can get to truth you know what i mean like so that's, that's yeah like but that's the game, that's the game isn't it it's just trying to figure out like how close and maybe even once you figure out like the most optimal way maybe, maybe that's not the most optimal for everybody too like then you take in circumstance like because it's interesting i do think there's it's interesting when you start to get into that of um you kind of seeing different like types of athletes um like i think paul fabritz who you've like he he talks about like the tiger and the gazelle of like you'll like those like as like athlete like types of you'll see those guys who are more of like a Ziani who's more of like that gazelle who's just skin and bones like all like tendon driven fascia driven super springy super bouncy like that very quick 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 ping versus more of like a like a treore who is just an absolute like tank like unit of a guy um and so it's like and not to say that he's not springy but like has more of like that that horsepower behind him um you think of like a harley versus like a suzuki hello right? and so it's interesting like so if you have like what's the optimal for each of those is it to make is it to optimize for like their current strength like or is it to bring them back a little bit more to the middle like would uh Kador do better with a little bit more strength work would Troy do better with more of like that that plyometric type like they both seem to be doing well as is so we just feed like whatever they're good at like that's that's even then a whole a whole another one to get into yeah that's what I mean, it's like the, I mean, to use basketball example, like John Morant jumps ridiculously high, but so does Zion Williamson. And yeah. like those two couldn't look any different in terms of jumping style, the way that, I mean, they jump the same way because jump, good jump mechanics are good jump mechanics, but it's ground contact like, times and like, yeah, you can just tell like it's a force dominant strategy versus like a elasticity, like elastic dominant strategy for sure. Yeah. Like it's, it's, like that's I've thought about it before. Like the one, the one group of people that I would be a little bit uncomfortable training would be elite level sprinters, because I would, I would be. It's so I mean we've mentioned it a couple. Times. It's so right on the edge of injury and running as fast as possible, and it's entirely different from what most other people could do in terms of volume, intensity, strategies. Like it's it's. And this, I remember Cal talking about this, actually. He's like, yeah, for my athletes, I get almost everything from, like, high school track coaches. Because high schoolers are slow, and they're trying to get faster. When you have guys that are already running a sub 10 second, 400 meter, it's like things just totally change. It's, again, that Preto distribution, but, like, it's, like, three deviations down on that Preto distribution to where you're at the 20% of the 20% of the 20% of the 20%. And it's like, man, I, that's so nuanced and so different that I would, I would be a little bit uncomfortable if somebody came to me. It's like, I want you to make me the hundred meter world champion. I run a nine, I run like a nine, nine. I need you to give me to a nine, six. I'd be like, I don't know if I'm your guy. <laughs> like, I, like I would love to try it. Having that, like having that conversation too. Most people would be like, yeah, screw it. Like, you know what I mean? I, yeah, I mean, if they like kept pushing back, I'd be like, yeah, all right, sure, I'll do it. But it would be like, are you sure? Like, I believe in the, my methods and I believe in all the people I've learned from. But it's just, that's that's one thing for me that's just such a different animal is that 100 meter sprint, 60 meter sprint, even into the 200 that in my eyes, I don't know. Do you feel the same way? Well, I think that's honestly, it's, I think that's true of anyone at like the absolute like pinnacle peak of like anyone can get somebody who's terrible better. Right. But like, how do you get somebody who's great better? Like the, the margin for error is so much smaller, like the, the nuance, the detail, like, it's just like, I think you just have to, the higher up you go in terms of like the higher level of skill you have to have to be able to match that. If we're actually going to, not that like everybody at the highest level of coaching has skill, but like in, th in theory. <laughs> what are you saying? Um, there? Yeah, no. <laughs> no, 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 what are you hearing? Like, <laughs> um, but so I think that would just be where it is of just like you and I are still young guys in our career, like just not feeling like we have that, that level of skill, that level of mastery. Like I think to, to me, that's my first or where my head goes of like, 
that being all it is. And to your point, like sprinters being a somewhat of like a different breed, like being a little weird, um, just because like they can be like, yeah, like a little, um, not like nervy, but like more sensitive to, they're like race cars, right? It's just like, they're more sensitive to like that fine tuning. And so like, if we go poking and prodding and you are poking and prodding the wrong thing, like can very much like mess up things um, kind of downstream. So, so yeah, that makes sense of that being like, if you work with like the world, world-class ping pong player, like so much more of like, just like a skill sport versus like a actual like raw athleticism sport, like can feel fairly confident that like, you're not going to mess them up quite as badly as something like track and field where it is like, almost exclusively pure output so like they're like the if you go that so that's probably why to your point of like it's you go strength skill like we have the most impact over like the strength athleticism sky and so like the farther you go that way the more of an impact and like the more skilled and like the scarier it is for us and then if you also go to the top of the pyramid so like yeah to your point that's like the creme de la creme so it's it's for sure like the the least room for error, probably the highest skill return. Um, and so especially at least for me, not having a background in track and field would be would be intimidating for sure. Yeah, it's I mean, it's sort of like there's some track coaches that are like if a guy was out out late the night before, they will not sprint them mm. just because it's like even if your nervous system is just like that tiny, tiny little bit off, you might miss a contraction somewhere and pull your hamstring that you wouldn't normally. That's like, like that, that Tony Holler feed the cats like kind of idea of like we'll just go take a nap for three weeks straight and show up and PR all of our meets like yeah it's it, it's like not having the experience with it it would be like if I do too a little like if I do too too many Nordics today are you gonna pull your hamstring like a week and a half from now and I just don't know that's why like it's that's an intimidating thing and it's it's when you look at a, almost any other sport. Like maybe it's the same, maybe it'd be the same way if somebody was like a 2,600 pound total guy in a powerlifting meet, they're like, I'd like to get to 2,650. Be like, that is going to be hard for me to do. First of all, because I don't know powerlifting like that, but same with sprinting, but it's the weight room almost is the sport in those areas. It's like Olympic lifting too, but it's like in soccer, it's like, just because somebody is an elite level soccer player doesn't mean they're an elite level weight room athlete at all. Like Usually it's guaranteed is the opposite. <laughs> yeah. It's almost, yeah. It's almost with certain, the best guys I know are like, I've never warmed up in my life. Like I've also never touched a dumbbell. Like, man, you could, you could make a lot of progress really fast. Yeah. So it's, that's, I mean, that's maybe this is me just like, no, 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 it is. It is interesting confessing too. to be a bad coach, but <laughs> <laughs> No, I think, I mean, I think a, like if you're, if you're not willing to, to admit that at some point, you're not willing to admit what you don't know, then we're just uh, posturing, but no, like to your point, like it is also weird too, of like those rules apply to almost no one else of like in almost every other sport, you need to be able to show up and perform on a bad day um, or be able to perform in a state that's not, that's not ideal, fatigued, banged up, like whatever, like all, all of these things. And like, I guess track and field, like if day comes like events, like, but it, it's, it is extremely different. Um, and so that ear, that is a weird concept of like half of the game is purely optimizing for that day. And that's definitely probably like for us coming from team sport backgrounds of where that's really not a thing. Like, okay, if you have a big tournament, you prepare for it, whatever, but like not anywhere near to the same degree. Like that is a concept that's very alien to us. I even think about like for even just for fighters of like the idea of like training and peaking and like timing weight cutting and all of like that, like that sounds like a very daunting task and something that I'm definitely not familiar with of like, all right, we're, we're eight weeks out and we have to get you in prime condition where you're absolutely performing, but we also have to cut nine pounds. Like that's a weird, that's a hard balance. Yeah. It's just weird things to get into. Um, and I guess that's just the, the nuance of, of each individual sport. But I do think to your point, like it's a very kind of unique, um situation with some of those track and field guys of like yeah if we're if we're not at a hundred like do we is it even worth training like is it better just to like go home and piss off versus like if you show up to training like hung over your coach is not going to be like oh <laughs> take the day you'll be fine okay. so they're gonna try and make it throw up yeah and it's 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 different it's even different within different levels of sports like that like 
a beginning Olympic lifter, an intermediate Olympic lifter, and like a Olympic level Olympic lifter, like they don't train the same way in the same way that a professional team in soccer doesn't train the same way as like an under 11 team. Dude, I think it, who is the, who is the goalkeeper? It might've been Vandersar for United, like towards like the end of his career um, when he's just like, he, he was an old dude. And like, there are stories of, of him, whoever it was, might not have been him, but would show up, he would show up to training like half an hour late. Like he'd yeah. take, like, <laughs> get a little stroll. He'd like catch a couple of like, catch a couple of volleys, like one or two saves, like, all right, it's my night done. And then he'll go out and perform on the weekend. It was just like, yeah, when you've gotten to that, when you've gotten to a certain level of mastery, like whatever it is, like diminishing returns or just optimizing for performance rather than continuation of like skill development. Like, yeah, it's very, it's a very dark and tangled web to get into, but that's where, that's where all the fun is too, like trying to figure it out. And so I think to part of the fun of us having conversations like this too, is being willing to both of us be like, yeah, like, Sounds fucking hard. I don't know what I would do with that. <laughs> like that's and not being like, oh yeah, I would do this. This is what you have to do. Like not pretending that we know everything that we're talking about. So so that's that's what it's all about. Yeah, it's yeah. I, the recovery thing is a cool thing. So I remember I remember there were some football teams that were like an old team. Like the guys on there were old, and they're like, yeah, we're we're just like not really going to train during the season at all, but we're going to be the most rested and the most well-prepared mentally team. And I mean, they would just, they would go out and kill everybody just because yeah. it was like, it, it's the same thing in my mind as if I can squat 315 and like I can squat 315 for like five or six reps. Like as long as I just get under the bar and hit 315 once every like two weeks or something, every week or so, I'm not going to lose it. Like I'm going to be able to do that just about forever. I'm not going to get stronger, but I'll be able to maintain that ability pretty well and like that's i think that's the Ed, edwin van der Sar thing it's like can i still catch a ball yeah all right cool i'm playing two games a week like let's let's just maintain that and i'm 38 i don't know it's dude that's you know. honestly what's where I, my head went with that just now is honestly a little weird of like it kind of brings me back to us talking about ben um and his like training like for himself and stuff like that and being that so like kind of tunnel vision of like it almost makes you wonder like with all of these different like approaches styles like it's almost like any of them can work maybe some are more optimal than the others but like any of them can work if they're applied well um and it's knowing i guess how when to apply each style but then when you do one going all in on that as well like if you're the team like before the we're not going to train where the recovery whatever but then you try and oh but these guys are doing this cool thing over here and you throw in this one extra little session that these other guys who are having success do and that throws the whole thing off and someone like it makes me think of someone like ben of like his doing as much stuff as he's done trained as many people as he's done he's learned from paulo quinn like i'm sure he knows a lot more than he like lets on about all of this stuff but is there almost a wisdom in deliberately ignoring some of these other things just to do this one thing really well of like and almost to the detriment of everything that we've talked about of pull from all of these different people like because there is like i have thought about it as, that as well like there's the idea of like a hybrid of you take the best of these two things and you make something even better or you fuck it up and you take the worst and you get something <laughs> worse you take what doesn't work here it doesn't work here so like that's always a possibility like the idea of sampling can almost be something that if you to it like to an extreme is then something where you are mastered nothing and you've just got these 15 different things and maybe that's someone like where someone like ben is like look i'm going to just get as good as i possibly can at this one thing um and see where that takes me and so far it's taken them somewhere that's that's pretty good so Talk to you. I think we've talked for about an hour and a half and just come to the conclusion that lots of people are smarter than us. We don't know a whole lot of shit and uh, do what you want and hope for the best. <laughs> yeah, this I what I'm taking out of this is that I should just stop coaching and <laughs> <laughs> which to I think we'll just uh, we'll just keep we'll stick to the podcast thing. We'll just keep talking about everybody else and doing other things. And then, yeah, we'll uh, we'll just talk about what sounds good. Yeah, we could just start a whole series of talking about all the stuff we don't know and what. We'll, <laughs> And hey, what we mean, don't, what we don't want to do, and who we don't want to coach. Exactly, exactly. It's a much longer list of what I don't know than what I do. So we'd have much more material, that's for sure. Yeah, that that is very, very true. <laughs> All right, dude. Well, I'm sure we could go kind of round and round in circles for this for for a little while. But this is actually, I've actually enjoyed this. This has been been quite fun. It is. It's always 
nice and humbling to kind of get into like some of these conversations. So it's like, it's humbling for me of like, oh yeah, there's a lot of people that know a lot more shit than me. And I actually don't know that much. And then also like, it's a little bit more like invigorating, invigorating, like inspiring of like, oh, there's all these different things. Like there's so many different things to get into. Like it's very, at least for me, it's easy to kind of fall into the trap sometimes of like, Uh, this is just fitness. Like we're just training athletes. I'm getting this guy a little bit faster and he's just going to go and still not do any, you know, it's like, it's very easy to get sucked into that. And so stuff like this, I I appreciate because it kind of gives you back that little bit of that little bit of spark, that little bit of verve of like why we, what's exciting about this, why we got into this in the first place. Um, So yeah, I appreciate, I appreciate you shooting the shit with me for a little while. Exactly, brother. I, it, I enjoyed it. It, it. Conversations like these kind of make me frustrated sometimes that there's so much out there that, <laughs> yeah. that isn't. It's like, I want this all in my brain, but it's not there. And like, it frustrates me to think about how long it'll take, but it's. I just try to laugh do. about it. That's the only thing that I can do. Like, oh, yeah, fuck, it is what it is. <laughs> it, it, that, that's exactly the right mindset that I need to adopt and I haven't yet. So <laughs> I'll be here to laugh at you whenever you need me to. Oh, I, I appreciate that. There's a lot of people that'll <laughs> laugh at me. <laughs> So let me, before I, I let you get out of here, like maybe give us a quick um, rundown. I know you've got some new stuff going on, like programming wise and that sort of thing, like telling people kind of where they can, what that, what that's about, if that's something that they're interested, where they can find that, like that sort of thing. Yeah. So the, the thing you could go out and get now, if you'd like, it's the, I have the soccer speed system and the soccer strength system there. I like to say it's the program. The soccer strength program is what I wish I kind of had when I was younger, the build in the base of the things I didn't have, come with realizations that ATG kind of took me through and some of the other things I think are extra applicable or a little less applicable to soccer training. And then if you're in Zach's case here and you want to run a little faster than you were before, uh, I'm just kidding, sort of. But, uh, <laughs> yeah, that's what I think the soccer speed system is, but it's, again, it's not a system that is, 12, 16 weeks, get you as fast as you can. It's 16 weeks to improve your speed, but also still keep you healthy and what I think is important for soccer. So I do one-on-one as well. If they're interested, shoot me a DM, but everything is on my Instagram, TikTok, YouTube, Twitter, everywhere fun, score performance, SK, AAR performance. So yeah, if you, if you want to reach out, reach out. Zach's got great stuff as well. So we got, we got, we have some, we were talking about it before. Somebody's going to have to take the, the, the title of king of soccer strength yeah, training. So it's definitely something that's, that's up for grabs. And so I know neither of us have done a good job of selling ourselves or our programs on this, <laughs> on this podcast, but no, in, in all seriousness, uh, Maddie actually does some, some really good stuff. And so if you are a soccer player that's looking to improve your performance, there's, um, I think he's definitely a really good resource. Someone you can't go wrong with. If you are looking to improve that strength side of things, that speed side of things, be a more, well-rounded more complete athlete would definitely recommend checking out one of his programs um and yeah dude one of one of these days someone's gonna someone's gonna move up in the world and get into some of those uh higher arenas some of those bigger and better things and see if we can't maybe change the game for the better a little bit yeah there's plenty of room for both of us so i'm not i'm not worried about it but i'll I'll still be competing but (laughs) It's like, all right, man. Well, thank you very much for giving me some time this evening to jump on and chat. Um, always good to connect, and definitely was a very fun, uh, fun conversation. So I appreciate you coming on, and we'll look forward to hearing from you again soon. Yes, sir, brother. Appreciate you having me. Absolutely.